Krishna is called the Poorn Avatar, the complete avatar, the highest manifestation that any being can aspire to. And rightly so. You see, a personality who can transform the very act of battle into being an opportunity for inner transformation. A very person who can transform all the adverse circumstances in the world and make us realize that they are all part of a great leela. And that our only concern should be having a deep love affair with the highest. A deep love affair with life itself. That life should become a song. Just like his Gita is a song. Life should become a dance. Just like his Leela with the gopis is a dance. Life should become a song, just like his playing on the flute is the most melodious thing in existence. That is Krishna in a nutshell. Signifying the very heart of prema, the very heart of love, that is the essence of Vaishnavism. Prema, love, love affair with the highest, love affair with existence itself. Compromising never on that, no matter what our circumstances. To be inwardly calm, to be inwardly in a state of bliss, to be inwardly in a state of such great contentment that everything else can be left behind. And to realize that life is never futile. Life can be full of a rich celebration. Life can be full of a divine ecstasy if only we allow it to. And Krishna personifies this through his own life. You see the very word Krishna comes from the word Akarshan. Karshan, Akarshan. The supreme attractor. In a way it's like the mystical law of gravitation. Krishna is the one who is attracting metaphorically all the gopis to dance around him. And he's dancing with each one. In the same way that you can look at the universe, at the center of each galaxy is a galactic center. Around that you can see the dance of the various stars and the various planets and so on. And eventually all the billions of galaxies perhaps are dancing around a Universal center, the center of all things is said to be Krishna. Just like the Sudarshan Chakra is revolving around his finger, so too is all of existence, all of the cosmos, all of life revolving around his very presence. And it's a metaphorical way to say something very deep. It deals with what we might call the ultimate law of attraction, where the very Love affair between the devotee and the object of devotion is eternal. Where they are constantly in a state of attraction between each other. Where not only are you to love the divine, but the divine when you love the divine has no choice but to love you back manifold. Love you back with an intensity which is compoundedly more. And that is what Krishna says. He says that whatever the devotee offers, he compounds it a million fold. He gives it back and that is the Vaishnav way, the Baal mystical way of looking at Krishna. The ultimate dancer dancing on the snake Kaliya, dancing amidst all circumstances, dancing amidst adversity. Turning everything into a song celestial, into a Bhagavad Gita. Turning the very battlefield into a Bhagavad Gita. But there are other aspects. Turning this whole episode in Vrindavan into a different sort of Gita. Turning the whole episode of Mathura into a sort of a Gita. So the different phases of his life. From the Baal, from the Gopal to the Parthasarthi of the Bhagavad Gita of the Mahabharata. Krishna signifies the dancing God. And there are so many life lessons we can directly imbibe. You see, particularly because his philosophy is a very practical one. He says, 
that no matter what your inclination in life what your calling in life you can fulfill that and you in fact should be fulfilling that with the fullness of your heart that is what he is teaching arjuna in the mahabharat that is the essence of it don't worry about what you need to do just act according to your self nature everything else will fall into place so that's the first lesson that is the meaning of dancing your own dance singing your own song you have your own song to sing in life you have your own dance to dance in life function according to that you see krishna is supremely adaptable krishna does not stick to a particular ideology and so on which is why throughout world mythology you'd find echoes of krishna in all traditions for example in christianity the old latin word christos that is the base of the word christ jesus christ is very akin to the way that krishna is called in bengali keshto you see their whole story of christ being born in a manger krishna being born in a jail both hiding from this tyrant king their parents their parents in danger the child in mortal danger and eventually the child being born in these strange circumstances but eventually vanquishing all in a spiritual sense so the story of krishna is an archetype of the highest truth it is not just about krishna it is about the archetype of the highest truth and that is why his color is blue black it signifies the colors of infinity his very life signifies the bridge between man and the supreme truth and you know in the indian tradition krishna has been called the milker of the upanishads he's he said to be the one who brings out the essence of the upanishads not only through his message in the gita but through the entirety of his life where you realize the highest within yourself where you realize aham brahmasmi within yourself where you realize tat tvam asi within yourself where you realize that your energies in life need to be balanced your energies in life need to be in such a harmony because only in harmony can you truly sing your song only when your energies are in harmony can you feel that you are able to function effortlessly can you feel that you are able to go into the very depth of yourself and function from there functioning from your ultimate capacity that is what krishna stands for you see the baul mystics of bengal have a very interesting take on krishna their version of krishna is not so um, conventionally moral and krishna lends its himself to a slightly immoral off track sort of a connotation because his whole life is about ecstasy he teases the gopis he teases the girls he he is able to go into battle he is able to talk about the greatest peace so he is many things and the bowls of bengal say that we only know krishna when we are able to drop all our conditioning when we are able to drop all our conditioning about what the divine stands for normally we think of the divine as being somehow very a very you know to get to the divine we need to be in a very saintly sort of a consciousness we need to be in a very um religious minded sort of a consciousness but no when it comes to krishna that's what we don't need at all we just need blissfulness in consciousness then only are we able to understand krishna without that we are not able to understand him at all how can you understand infinity if you already have preconceived ideas about it you have to go with a consciousness with this which is completely without content which is completely established in its innate nature of joy in its innate nature of bliss otherwise you are sure to misunderstand krishna 
because then your mind will be telling you oh this is wrong that is wrong this is this he shouldn't have done in his life he shouldn't have participated in the mahabharat war you see it's not correct for him to take sides in the mahabharat war for example or somebody might say it was not correct for him to marry so many people so many women or somebody might say it was not correct of him to tease the gopis in the village but the that's the thing with krishna he's a contradiction in himself it's very difficult to categorize him in any category it's very difficult to label him he is full of contradictions and that is the beauty of krishna amidst contradictions do we exist in the world the world is a heap of contradictions where there is black there is white where there is light there is darkness where there is joy there is sorrow and so on and so forth we have to accept both sides of the coin and that is krishna's basic message accept everything participate in everything but don't get identified with anything that is immature and that is exactly what he is telling arjun in the geeta also that is one of his main life lessons to arjun not only as a warrior but as a seeker of truth also don't get identified with your acts be like as shakespeare said be like that actor who is completely unmoved by the role he is playing he is deeply emotionally invested in it but somewhere he is in a state of witnessship where he can see that all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players we are merely merely players in a greater script in a script written by the hand of the greater and that hand of the greater is what krishna represents that hand of the highest love that hand of the highest contradiction that hand of the highest omnipotence is what krishna represents and no intellectual uh, conviction will be able to make you believe that there is no need to believe it you can just look at his life everything he did was done with so much flow of bliss whether he was teasing the gopis whether he was going into battle it was done with such a flow of bliss such a smile on his face that that again becomes the next lesson to understand we can go either crying into something or we can go with our best energies into something you see for example if a crisis faces somebody there are two options one can go with a very sullen mind a very sullen and somber and unhappy demeanor into that circumstance but krishna says no there is no need you have a choice you can go blissfully into that also go blissfully towards death also he's telling arjun don't hold yourself back if you go blissfully into death then you've achieved samadhi you've achieved your godliness you've achieved you are born a new death is inevitable things are bound to happen while we are here understand that the real treasure you have is your consciousness make that blissful in whatever you do so this is very primary to understand make your consciousness blissfulness into all uh, into blissful in with to all you do through all you do and in all you do your responsibilities are secondary your responsibilities are your duties your dharma all that comes and goes yes it's important to do one's dharma but it's the primary dharma is to go directly into making your consciousness feel full of love feel full of freedom feel full of well being feel full of a vibe of blissfulness then whatever comes out of it is bound to be productive is bound to be natural is bound to relax you and not only that it's able to dispel the very tension from your life you see this whole idea that we need to achieve something we need to get a result of something krishna is completely against that he says the result doesn't matter at all your energy matters so this is again the next lesson to imbibe from krishna your energy in what you do matters the result does not matter at all in fact the result orientation of your mind becomes the very limitation it disallows you from opening yourself up it's like clenching your fist you know you're holding on to your expression open your fist be open 
and krishna signifies inner openness he says that within your inner kingdom everything is there you are just created mental barriers around yourself that's why you cannot see the highest dimensions and he shows arjuna the higher dimensions through showing his divine form and so on he says that everything in life can become a doorway to god no matter what it is no matter if you are uh, fighting a battle as a warrior no matter if you are ruling a kingdom as a king no matter what your leadership position no matter what your job it could be small it could be large in the eyes of the world that doesn't matter at all it is the dimension of consciousness that he is concerned with over there you need to have trust in the greater over there you need to have a certain degree of faith that no i am larger than this i am able to attain to a celestial realization i am able to move to a higher consciousness and that is the essence of krishna consciousness moving to a higher state of consciousness moving to a higher state of energy where even if at the mind and body you are tired actually no tiredness comes to you because there is no fatigue your consciousness is dancing with the bliss of the greater your consciousness is active with the energy of something far larger something which belongs to the realm of infinity and that comes from your innermost core and that is what godliness is krishna represents godliness through his life he doesn't need to preach about godliness his life is a totality a oneness a great organic unity and that itself is that which is whole that itself is that which is sacred that itself is that which is truly religious all other religion is completely fake completely pseudo once you start understanding krishna then you find that every cell in your body can dance a subtle dance can be blissful each cell in your brain can feel that even the mundane can become super conscious even what you thought till yesterday was ordinary can be transcended and you can realize that within you is the capacity to know the highest freedom to know the highest bliss and then you realize that life has an intrinsic value what is the value of life the value of life is not that you need to achieve a particular state of being within the world no you need to achieve, attain a state of being within your consciousness that is the very basic essence of krishna which is why he appeals to people of all psychologies of all temperaments you see on the battlefield he is talking to arjun who is a warrior but at the same time krishna can appeal to the ascetic in the forest at the same time he can appeal to a to a to a uh, to a mother of a child at the same time he can appeal to the highest scholar he's got this ability to transcend all categories all sorts of people can be attracted to him because there are so many dimensions of his life one dimension of his life is of course as that infant and growing up that little naughty child who used to eat the curd steal the ghee steal the buttermilk and so on harass his mother and all that in a spirit of fun the cowherd boy the shepherd boy all his adventures he had in vrindavan with the gopis within this idyllic circumstance of village life with the animals with the cows and so on his great ability for compassion empathy love was evident in the friendships he had with the other shepherd boys his great penchant for connecting with nature was evident in the way he had the interaction with his animals his great ability to mix with everyone in the village just be ordinary showed how deeply his empathy for the most ordinary people went and then of course his going to mathura killing the king kans and attaining to that throne not taking it renouncing it moving on becoming a person of many dimensions 
eventually culminating in the parthasarthi of the mahabharat a pivotal role he plays the mahabharat cannot be without krishna and in a way he is representative of that idea of entirety of civilization the entirety of civilization will collapse if there is not that consciousness of a krishna within it and this is the crisis we face in the world today you see had krishna not been there for the mahabharat civilization as might have got completely destroyed it was moving towards that but because of his presence the war for justice was fought in such a manner that eventually civilization could continue man could continue to flourish in many ways evil could be destroyed the boundaries and the crisis facing man could be overcome but in today's age again we have to understand that therefore krishna consciousness is more needed in the world today than ever we might not be having krishna in person but the consciousness that he represents the blissfulness that he represents the wisdom that he represents needs to be available to us even today and what does that mean what does that imply that implies that we have a spiritual radiance and a spiritual understanding through whatever our pursuits in life not just as individuals but in our collective consciousness you see man has become such that there's so much technology at our fingertips we have so much technological energy available but where is the concomitant energy of consciousness to be able to put a check on that one cannot expect politicians to do it one cannot expect nation states to do it it can only happen within one's own being and within one's own being is the ability to attain to a great calmness to attain to a great tranquility to attain to a great balance through that you create a vibe of all these factors within your immediate circle and by and by that is how you can spread your light in the world and society eventually can also benefit by the value of your internal being that is what it truly means to be mindfully alive that is what it means to be truly consciously alive that is the vibe which a, for example a buddha creates in the world his very presence creates a vibe which frees people from fear which frees frees people from anxiety and so on now naturally we are not buddhas naturally we are our, we have our material desires our material pursuits and so on and that is where krishna is very relevant because he says you don't have to renounce the world and become a disciple of the buddha he says you can flow on in your life you can flow on in your material activities you can flow on in your everyday circumstances but in that also be born anew from within feel resurrected into a state of bliss every day wake up in a state of bliss do what is suitable for your self nature but at the same time do it with a great honesty of purpose a purity and then your consciousness remains young youthful pure the biggest problem in life is that people are doing things which they don't want to do they're going against their own highest nature krishna says your own highest nature is all knowing it does know what to do but you have to listen to it because it's it echoes the voice of the greater it echoes the voice of the macrocosm you see all our anxieties in life arise from the fact that we think we are doers we are doers of everything that we do no we are placed in positions where things happen and yes while free will has a hand in what we do it is always the greater action of the universal energy which is acting through us accept that that is the whole significance the whole metaphorical significance of krishna playing on the flute the flute 
is the world the fru- fru- flute is the jivatma krishna is the paramatma the paramatma plays his tune through the flute of the world or through the flute of the jivatma the individual you and i but the melody comes out real and true if the flute is clean if the flute is allowing that melody to flow through it unhindered then whatever you do comes through in harmony then only do you become an instrument of the greater and this very philosophy of that common bamboo flute which krishna plays is echoed through the highest buddhist philosophy also it is echoed through zen philosophy to become a flute it is echoed through daoist philosophy of japan of china you are to become a flute through which an instrument through which the greater acts through you and that is what krishna tells arjun he says arjun just be an instrument i act through you know yourself to be an instrument and then your heart will dance your mind will dance you'll forget all your anxieties you'll attain to a blissful state of mind and heart you look at things with empathy because suddenly you realize that there's nothing for you to be anxious about you can be free in your action because you know that the greater is acting through you once you do that that is the act of surrender then you feel that you go from the non essential to the essential in life freeing your energy surrendering it and allowing the greater to act is the greatest act of dynamism that a person can do and that is the hallmark of very dynamic people actually they function with a sense of abandon You see in the samurai tradition it's called a sense of recklessness where the warrior when he's on the battle just acts as the body takes him there's no thought involved our minds are the uh, uh, impediment our minds keep stopping our action keep stopping the flow of the river of action as it were why do we feel so stagnated why do we feel so bored in life because we are not allowing the music of the greater to play through us let it play with its joy let it play with its full volume let it play with its completeness of harmony through us and then you realize that you can be fulfilled through all happenings of life the river does travel through the valley the river does travel through stony path uh, through stony circumstances it travels through many pathways until it reaches the ocean but all the while it flows and it flows with a certain energy so too should our life be flowing through all sorts of things eventually becoming one with the ocean and that is what krishna represents which is why he is utterly unique you see buddhism cannot conceive of a god like krishna Judaism cannot conceive of a god like Krishna. Christianity does not have a god like Krishna. Krishna is unique. Krishna is his own utter individual being, completely like no other. And that is how we should be celebrating him. To understand that it is through this uniqueness that we become enlightened not only within ourselves but are able to understand the reality of the higher no institution can do that for us to understand the personality of krishna does not need any institution it needs a certain energy vibe through which you can connect to his higher truth only then can you attain to a heart to heart relationship with him otherwise you can be completely closed no book is telling is going to be able to teach you how to establish a relationship with the higher the only way to do it is to feel such warmth such a vibe of prema such a vibe of love in your heart and mind that you are bridged with the ultimate through the very act of bliss the very act of bliss is the only way to come close to god that is the vaishnava way there is no other way to come close to god to come close to the highest manifestation of 
nature, the highest manifestation within existence, is to be connected through it, to it, through the treasure of loving capacity within us. Let it overflow. Let it come across blissfully through you. Then only can you understand life to be a celebration. Then only can you have a deeper trust in life. The alchemy of inner transformation, the ability to change a base metal into gold exists within us. Alchemy is only a metaphor for saying that we are base metal if we think of ourselves as body and mind and we transform ourselves into body, mind and spirit into pure gold once we understand that we are instruments of a higher power, once we understand that we are instruments through which the prema, the love of the highest spark can flow through us, that we are capable of infinite beauty, infinite compassion, infinite consciousness, infinite bliss and infinite love. That is alchemy. That is the ability to transform your self-image from being one of limitedness to being one of infinity, to feeling like you belong to eternity, to the timeless realm, then does our communion with the greater happen. Then do we have a great spaciousness within our being. And creating that spaciousness within our being means what? It means getting rid of anxiety. It means allowing the soil of our heart and mind to be ready for the seeds of happiness, which Krishna is constantly spraying. You see, it is said that if the soil is ready and then the seed falls, there is no stopping the growth of the fruit-bearing tree. And that is the way Krishna is looked at within the world. All we have to do is prepare our soil of heart and mind. And through that comes about the greatest miracle. In Indian mythology, it is known as the guest coming and knocking on the door. He is ever knocking. Krishna is ever knocking on the door. Heed the call, open the door. It's completely up to us. And then the energies of the Jivatma and the Paramatma become joined. The energies rise together in a complete and spontaneous fulfillment a multi-dimensional fulfillment. You see, Indian mythology looks at life not so much as a dichotomy between the divine and man. No. In the Abrahamic traditions, there is a very clear-cut dichotomy. There is the divine, there is God, and there is man, Adam and Eve, and so on. But in Indian philosophy basically the division between god and the between the divine and man is not like that it is not completely like that within man also exists the divine within man echo uh, echoes the voice of the divine in miniature so within us abides the highest all we need to do is listen to that voice of the highest and then you are able to invite its greater functioning into your own life. That is in essence what the law of attraction means. Once you understand that within you, there is this great, within your innermost soul, there is this great light, this great music within you and you are able to hear that music as the voice of your consciousness, then there is nothing stopping the entire melody of life, the entire harmony and blissfulness of life flowing through you. That is the only way to dissolve our anxieties, that is the only way to dissolve our tensions, and that is in essence the greatest meditation, where you eventually become nothing, you just become a great receptacle for the highest energy of the universe, that which is represented by Krishna himself.